Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first panel of our conference. We're going to talk about the economic outlook in the context of a rising China. I'm very excited to have uh, a brilliant batch of people here uh, in this uh, first session. And I would like to start introducing uh, the panelists to you. I'd like to start with uh, uh, the Minister of uh, Ethiopia, Arkebe Okube, Special Advisor uh, to the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Abiy Ahmed, who you all know collected the Nobel <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> and I'd like to insist on the fact that uh, uh, Arkebe is uh, part of this, is part of the government, and he is also the mastermind of some of the successful programs that uh, Ethiopia implemented, in particular uh, in the sphere of economics. He has written about the uh, transformation of African economies. He's also written about uh, the role of China in Africa, Oxford University Press books that I highly recommend reading. Like uh, to continue uh, with Sergei Storchak, uh, right uh, on the, the right, uh, of uh, our seating order here. He is Deputy Minister of Finance uh, of the Russian Federation. He's been in government almost forever. That's uh, what he told me, for 25 years and more. So someone who really knows the modern Russia and the economics uh, of it, and uh, I'm looking forward uh, to your insights. Then we have uh, Il Sakong uh, from, uh, from Korea. He has a long and prestigious career in the Korean government. He was Minister of Finance from 1987 to 1988, and he has been uh, the person responsible for the success of the uh, Korean G20 presidency in uh, uh, 2010. And uh, uh, he's also a scholar. He writes and, uh, uh, about, about the economic uh, situation in Asia. He has a PhD from the UCLA, UCLA University of California, Los Angeles. Then I'm particularly happy to introduce uh, Saliedin Mizuara, uh, the, the man waving here. Uh, <laughs> I'm introducing you. <laughs> He's uh, started off as a businessman. He's been the CEO of a uh, 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 textiles group, Spanish textiles group, Tavex, here in Morocco. Uh, he's been in government in Morocco for something like uh, 15 years, from 2004 to 2017. Uh, and he has been covering different positions, which is uh, quite impressive, uh, from uh, uh, the Ministry of Commerce to the Ministry of Finance to the Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs. That's uh, quite a parcours, uh, je dirais. C'est très bien de vous avoir hein, sur le panel. Uh, on va parler anglais uh, ici, parce que la plupart des, des panélistes parlent par l'anglais, et voici l'anglais est plus facile dans le contexte de discussion économique. Alors vous parlez espagnol. <laughs> Then I'm happy to introduce to, to you uh, uh, Naoki Tanaka, over there. He's the president of the Center for International Public Policy Studies in Tokyo, an author of many, many, many books, a very long CV, a distinguished scholar, and there's one book, again, that I can recommend. I have not read it, unfortunately, but I should, because the title is provocative and interesting. The title is The Great Stagnation of China. This is the period of 2016. Let's see uh, and let's discuss what uh, you find about, about the Chinese economy. And then, last but not least, next to me, Olivier Blanchard, that I think in this room everyone knows. Uh, he's the former president of the American Economic Association. He's the former chief economist uh, of the International Monetary Fund. He was there at the helm of this organization in troubling times uh, from 2008 to 2015. He is one of the reasons why the world's economic and financial crisis uh, was managed in a reasonably well uh, way. I would say uh, still we are suffering from it or from the, from the consequences, but the fact that uh, this didn't uh, uh, have larger negative effects, I think, is, large, is also due to him. He is a uh, professor emeritus from the MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and uh, he is one of the founding fathers of what we economists call new Keynesianism. Uh, and if you had uh, read the news yesterday, uh, Bloomberg 
ran an article, for example, that speculated who might win the Nobel Prize on Monday. We'll all be here again, uh, still here on Monday. And uh, Olivier is mentioned there, and uh, we think should be crossing uh, our fingers. It would be so fantastic to have two uh, Nobel Prize winners here in our room. Uh, but uh, let's see. This is, of course, highly uncertain, and I, I know how, how embarrassing it must be to hear this every year. Uh, but the Bloomberg article ended with the sentence saying that uh, there will be a novel for those who created the new Keynesianism. The question is just when. So with this introduction, um, I would like to uh, sketch very briefly how we're going to proceed here. I think we'll have a first round talking about the uh, overall outlook uh, of the world economy, um, and then a second round where we'll uh, look more deeply into the role of China. This is uh, how this uh, session is uh, set up, the context of rising China. And then, time permitting, in the third round, talk about yeah, the multilateralism that goes beyond the concerns that we all have in trade policy, currency, uh, and investment uh, topics uh, if, we, if we have time. I'd like to start with uh, Olivier Blanchard um, to give us his, uh, his views on the transatlantic economy, the United States and Europe, where we have funny times, really, for an economist. Uh, we have ultra-low interest rates. We have full employment in many countries, the US, for example, Germany, Japan, essentially. Um, and uh, we have almost no inflation. Uh, and, and the big question is, how can we explain that? Is this going to last? What are uh, governments uh, to do about that? Please, Olivier. Uh, thank you for the uh, excessively kind <laughs> and optimistic remarks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, I always enjoy this meeting. I came last year and enjoyed it. Uh, I thought that I would focus my remarks on macroeconomics rather than geopolitics, at least in the first round. This reflects comparative advantage mm -hmm. or comparative disadvantage with respect to geopolitics. Uh, and I would focus on high-income economies, as you indicated, because uh, uh, others on the panel are much more, more competent than me mm -hmm. to talk about the rest of the world. Um, I, s I want to focus on two, what I see as two fundamental forces shaping the, 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 the economy of advanced economies, and by implication, uh, the world economy. Uh, so the first one really doesn't, doesn't have much to do with geopolitics, although it's global. And it is uh, the advent of extremely low interest rates. Mm -hmm. Now, that's much more than a technical issue. I think it's really a regime change, which is going to have profound implications uh, for policy and the way policy is made uh, in the next, say, decade or so. Now, the first thing to say is and the interest rates are amazingly low. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you know, the, the yield curve, the uh, structure of interest rates looking forward for the Eurozone is negative up to 25 years, which is, mm -hmm. has never been seen. Very similar in Japan, not terribly far from this in the US. So this is a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is every indication that it's going to stay. Some people say, well, tomorrow morning, rates will go up again. But if you look, this is really something which started in the mid-80s. Mm. and has basically steadily took a take, taken place over time, and the factors behind are probably there to stay. So I think we have to think of a world in which we're going to be uh, exposed to, to very low interest rates. Now, why is this important beyond macroeconomics, beyond just the narrow uh, aspect? It is because it has implications for monetary and fiscal policy. It basically says that monetary policy has been the instrument that governments have used over the last 40, 50 years mm -hmm. to try to direct the economy, make it you know, operate at full employment or something close. And we've come to the end of what monetary policy can do. Mm -hmm. uh, you see it in the discussions that took, took place in the, in the Eurozone uh, two weeks ago. There's an increasing notion that we've done everything we can, and therefore monetary policy cannot be used. So the main instrument that governments have had to basically counter fluctuations uh, is really not, not operative. And so the implication is, well, what else do we have? And fortunately, the answer is what, is what makes things really bad for money policy makes things really good for fiscal policy, which is that the cost of borrowing is very low, mm -hmm. the cost of deficits, the economic cost of mm -hmm. deficits is very low, and so there's more space 
But the big issue is that from a policy point of view, monetary policy and fiscal policy are, con uh, are conducted in very different ways. The second process is much more political, much, mm -hmm. much more complex. And I think that the issue we're going to face is whether fiscal policy is going to be used right. Mm -hmm. And there's a risk that it is not. I'm looking at you, not at you as I'm such, <laughs> but you as a German, uh, to think that that may well be an issue. And I think that in thinking about what could happen if we have adverse shocks and things like this, this is really first order. Mm -hmm. This is not the only implication of low rates. Uh, it has implications for inequality, for example. I mean, if you're a saver mm -hmm. and you rely on bonds mm -hmm. as your income, you're mm -hmm. in trouble. Mm -hmm. And this has political implications. Mm -hmm. So that was the first force. I put it on, you know, it's not related to China, mm -hmm. uh, although China has played a role in the low rates. But I think it's really something we have to think about. So the second one, the second force that I want to talk about uh, is, is this nexus between inequality, uh, populism, protectionism, mm -hmm. which gets us closer to, uh, mm -hmm. to issues related to China. Uh, the facts on inequality are really striking. And inequality measured all kinds of ways really has had decreased until the 1980s in most advanced mm -hmm. economies. And it has turned around to different degrees. In the US, obscenely so. Mm -hmm. Uh, in France, actually, not very much, mm -hmm. but the perception of people mm -hmm. is that inequality matters a lot, and therefore, mm -hmm. even in France, it is, it is a major issue. And this is going to bring a number of pushbacks, reactions, which may be tractable or may be intractable. Uh, it's going to lead to a pushback in terms of capital taxation. I think we have to be ready for a world in which wealth is going to be taxed more heavily, in which corporations are going to be taxed more heavily, uh, this may happen smoothly, mm -hmm. this may not. The OECD just came out with a plan to mm -hmm. have corporate taxation uh, organized at the, at, at the world, at the global level, and I think that's progress. But I think this is going to be a big change. Capital is not going to have it easy, mm -hmm. and that has both economic and political implications. The one that I want to focus on and finish my uh, remarks with is uh, the uh, protectionism mm -hmm. aspect, the, the trade wars, mm -hmm. which is clearly... Not, I mean, which is nearly not triggered only by inequality, but is part of a, of a general reaction against the way things have been running. And here I want to make a number of, of points. The first one is the mechanical effects of tariffs is actually, from a macroeconomic point of view, mm -hmm. not a big deal. Mm -hmm. When we crank our malls and we put tariffs mm -hmm. in, well, you have changes in relative prices, but they don't mm -hmm. do a whole lot. And the reason is for a typical country, exports go down, Mm -hmm. But imports go down as well, which means more of it is, uh, comes from domestic production. So you have foreign demand which decreases, mm -hmm. domestic demand which increases. Reallocation is a bit tough, but you don't get big effects. Mm -hmm. So if this was the only, we had agreed basically to put tariffs once and for all. I would not like it, but it would not be the end of the world, would not create a recession. What is much more worrisome in the short run is the induced effect on investment. Which, and that comes not so much from the tariffs, but from the uncertainty. Mm -hmm which has come with the trade wars, with uh, international relations. Because if you do not know whether there's going to be a tariff on country X or on good Y, you basically wait. Mm -hmm. Now, from your point of view, waiting three months or six months is not a big issue. Mm -hmm. But when you know, many firms do this, you can have a collapse of investment mm -hmm. uh, due to the option value of waiting, and that can be very costly. And that's what we're starting to see mm -hmm. to different degrees. We've seen it. It took a while to, uh, to happen in the UK with Brexit, but it's happening. Basically, firms are just waiting, waiting for the next elections in the US, waiting for various things. Uh, so this, this is really, the, in the short run, the thing which worries me. In the long run, there are big effects. And basically, we're seeing global trade decrease. Mm -hmm. And that really, what we're seeing is deglobalization, mm -hmm. in effect. Uh, not only because of that, not only because of tariffs, but security issues. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not want to in, import fridges mm -hmm. or refrigerators mm -hmm. if they have some embedded component which allows some foreign country to actually know what is in your fridge. Mm -hmm. So we may see a, a drastic decrease uh, in, 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 uh, in trade. Uh, carbon tax is not going to help. Uh, it becomes costly to actually uh, have goods uh, travel uh, large distances. Uh, Political uncertainty may make you want to deal with 
suppliers in countries close to you rather than uh, in Asia, for example. I think all this is, may well happen. And this has major implications. For the short run, not sure. I'll finish with what people probably, what people always ask me, which is, well, are we going to have a recession? Mm -hmm. And I think that I've given my answer to it, which is we're probably going to get an effect on investment, which may, may lead to pessimism and consumption going down. So it could happen. I, in the case of the US, I do not think so, because we have an administration who seems quite indifferent to spending. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if needed, my guess is that they'll do the wrong thing, but for mm -hmm. the right purposes in this case, uh, you will see a fiscal expansion. Mm -hmm. I'm much more worried about Europe, where mm -hmm. fiscal has mm -hmm. many more strings mm -hmm. attached, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that they'll do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So my guess is probably <coughs> not uh, slow down, probably a slow down, probably not a recession. But uh, again, I want a footnote. It could happen <laughs> if things get worse. <laughs> I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, talking about Germany, we believe at the Kiel Institute that uh, we are in a recession. So the third quarter uh, in Germany had negative gro growth, the second quarter too. So technically speaking, we're in a, in a recession in Germany already. And that, of course, drags is a drag on the entire Eurozone and EU economies. Um, I've seen uh, uh, Naoki Tanaka, who, who wants to, to, to jump in, and, and, and why not? I, I have uh, my order, but I'm flexible, and, and seeing, seeing how eager you are to, to uh, comment, please, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, may I continue the ineffectiveness of monetary policy, which presented by uh, Professor Blanchard. <coughs> so, uh, Japanification of monetary phenomena are now spreading in the world, in Europe and North America. So when we see the negative interest rate, uh, I think uh, John Hicks uh, mentioned about uh, almost uh, zero natural rate of interest. Uh, so uh, he, Mr. Uh, John Hicks mentioned the bad harvest uh, in Ireland in 19th century. At that time, farmers didn't want to borrow money in order to seed, uh, in order to sow seeds. So that's the phenomena of uh, natural interest rate is almost zero. At that time, monetary policy will not work. So uh, these are the situation we are now observing. So in this situation, fiscal expenditure will be very important if we face a very deep recession. In the case of Japan, uh, from this month, our government uh, uh, raised uh, consumption rate, uh, con consumption tax rate. In order to face the next very difficult situation, so in the very near future, monetary policy Will not, will not work in developed countries. So mm -hmm. another measure should be considered if we have to face the very difficult situation in the management of the demand. That's my understanding. Yeah, uh, thank you, Naoki. I, I think uh, there is uh, quite some consensus here, at least uh, amongst the two of you, that, uh, that fiscal policy has more to do, in, certainly in, in, in Europe. Now, talking about uh, Japanification, that's, of course, uh, an issue that in Africa is very far away. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to, to give the word to Akebe Okube. Uh, Ethiopia has been growing very fast. Many areas in Africa have had very high growth rates, not just over the last years, but this has taken, uh, this is, has been going on for a while now. Um, could you help us understand uh, what the current situation is uh, of this region, of your country in particular? and uh, uh, what the outlook is? What are the big challenges you are facing? <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, first, uh, many thanks for your congratulations uh, on the Nobel Peace Prize uh, winner or prime minister, which I believe is uh, a prize for Africa, uh, not just for, for Ethiopia. And Ethiopia has uh, been uh, navigating uh, an economic growth uh, quite fast and rapid, but more or less also equitable growth. 
So for the last 15 years, the economy has been growing by 10.5%. And uh, in terms of shared growth, as an important indicator, average life expectancy has increased from 44 in 1991 to 66 uh, in 2016. This is a 21 years uh, increase in average life expectancy, which is on average twice uh, the Africa's average uh, uh, growth rate. Uh, this morning, I would like to talk uh, the broader picture. And my perspective will be from a policymaker's perspective, but from a developing country or a developing country, especially African perspective. This uh, topic is critical, and we could see two central issues here. The first one is the world political and economic outlook and the growth of African countries or developing countries is going to be determined and influenced not only by the domestic uh, uh, policies, but also the broader global uh, outlook. So this is central for developing countries. The second aspect is the rise of China. And uh, this is quite critical because we are in a sino-centric uh, global order. It's not a hypothetical issue, and China, for good or for bad, is an important and critical uh, player. Uh, so I will try to focus on this uh, bigger picture. Uh, some 200 years ago, the great uh, Napoleon uh, said, China is a sleeping giant. Let her sleep, for when wakes, she will shake the world. This was exactly 200 years back, and China used to be the largest economy between 1,500 and <coughs> 1820. And since then, since the Opium War, China has declined its uh, power and influence while it was the largest economy during this period. And now we see the return of China in the global economic uh, outlook. So it's quite critical without exaggeration or without uh, alarmist uh, approach. We need to be realistic in the world we are in. The first point I would like to focus is that uh, uh, since 2007, as Oliver indicated earlier, uh, the global economy is in a slow down mode. Uh, it hasn't yet been able to uh, be back. Uh, the growth rate, <coughs> which was observed uh, a decade back before the financial crisis. And, and this is quite worrying for developing countries because it limits what they can sell in global market. It limits uh, the growth uh, space they can have. Uh, and the most critical issue is uncertainty, and this is quite valid or uh, important in terms of investment. Since year 2007, for the last 10 years, FDI outflow, I mean ending flow, has been more or less flat, uh, about 1% increase every year. And this compared with double digit growth of FDI uh, is quite, uh, quite uh, alarming issue uh, because African countries, developing countries, need FDI for their uh, growth. I would like to highlight also that uh, the increasing inequality is a critical issue. The marginalization of developing countries and also the increase in equality, even with an advanced economy, is a time bomb that uh, shakes the stability of the economy as well as the political stability. I would also like to raise a third critical point, climate change. Climate change is a global issue that directly influences economic growth, and uh, both developing countries and advanced economies need to bring this uh, uh, issue and, and give it uh, uh, centrality. In the last uh, 30 uh, years, between 1990 and 2020, uh, the carbon emission has increased by 
50%. And by the end of the century, the uh, global warming will reach about three uh, degrees Celsius. So this is a concern. I think advanced economies as well as developing countries should be looking. On the second team, the rise of China, what I would like to highlight is the rise of China is a reality. It's not a theoretical or a, debil a debatable issue. China is a propeller of the global economy. 30% of the growth rate globally every single year in the last few years is generated by China. So it has a significant influence in the uh, global uh, economic growth. We have also seen China's contribution in global GDP is increasing. By year 2000, China's GDP was only about one trillion. And in 2020, China's GDP is reaching 15 trillion, which is 16% of global GDP. And 27% of uh, global manufacturing is concentrated in China. Uh, this gives a great impetus and in terms of influence in trade, in investment, and also in global uh, uh, order as well. And uh, we have seen significant improvement in the livelihood of the Chinese people, especially the contribution in terms of poverty alleviation. And, and this is uh, linked also with the improving the well-being of uh, uh, global population. On the green economy, <clears throat> I would like to highlight this point. The Chinese are making critical advancement in this area. It may be debatable to say that China is focusing on uh, building sustainable environment, not from the belief that uh, uh, climate change is a major risk, but definitely what is critical is they are working that the current strategy of consumption of significant material and the damage to the environment cannot be sustained. So they are looking at their competitiveness and uh, China is becoming uh, a renewable uh, super, superpower. China has now generates 700 gigawatt of renewable energy, which is equivalent to the combined generation of uh, renewable energy in the US, Germany, India, and Brazil. Uh, and, and, and this is quite important in terms of building circular economy. So the Chinese effect, the China effect, and as a global public good is an important area we need to consider. The last point uh, I would like to focus is what is the implication of these uh, two critical issues, the global economic outlook and the rise of China. And here uh, my uh, perspective on this issue is we are aware about the increase protectionism and the trade war, as uh, Oliver indicated earlier. However, what we need to say is there are two approaches uh, we may need to consider, or two avenues. One is who gets a bigger share from the existing cake is one issue, and this is linked with the friction between China and the US or uh, among the advanced economies. However, there is a second way of looking at this issue. How can we make the pie bigger so that the economy grows faster, so that uh, prosperity could be ensured and we can, we can prevent uh, the looming crisis and recession? And, and it's absolutely critical that uh, uh, thinkers and policymakers consider that uh, the common win-win uh, position is going to be critical in, in our approach. In Africa, China is involved, is a critical player. It's one of the top four investors in Africa, along the US, UK, and France. Uh, it's the largest trading partner of Africa, and we could see the trade uh, volume increasing from 10 billion in year 2000 to 220 billion in 2014, 
and uh, it's also a major financier in infrastructure. These are quite critical, and we as Africans, we don't see this as a scramble for Africa. We are engaged with our traditional partners, with Europe, with the US, but Africa should also engage with China uh, and, and try to exploit what could uh, positively be generated. So in broad, again, we need to have a realistic optimism, uh, and I don't think there is a need for being alarmist, but we also need to focus on big powers and developing countries, I believe, should work on how to make the pie bigger and to see a win-win so that uh, humanity can be saved and uh, prosperity could be sustained. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you very much, uh, Olivier. I, I was struck by a remark that Arkebe made about FDI. And I think that it links nicely to the points I made and, and may be useful, which is, on the one hand, if you're a firm, you're reluctant to do FDI in another country because of the tariffs, uncertainty, and so on, so you're going to kind of pull back. At the same time, the fact that the interest rates are so damn low on you know, bonds of, uh, of, of major uh, governments uh, in, in, the, in, in advanced economies means that it is very attractive from a financial point of view to actually invest uh, in countries which have their act together, like Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that if we look at FDI, it's probably this tension between the two which determines whether there is FDI in a country or not. But clearly there are possibilities. Low rates are good for Africa, yeah. potentially. Actually, <clears throat> this is a, an important point. Uh, uh, Ethiopia had focused on attracting FDI the last uh, six, seven years in particular. And the prime focus has been on productive investment, especially in manufacturing. Uh, and between year 2012 and 2017, uh, FDI inflow increased by uh, fourfold. And uh, its share in uh, Africa's uh, FDI inflow increased from 1% to 10% of Africa's uh, FDI inflow. And in us, East Africa, it uh, increased from 10% close to 50% of FDI inflow. And, and, and it's true, as you indicated, that uh, this is an area we need uh, to tap. Let me, let me take this uh, discussion uh, to Salahidin Mizwar, uh, because uh, uh, I agree what uh, Olivier said. In the low interest uh, rate environment, uh, countries like uh, Morocco that want to attract uh, capital, that need to accumulate capital, uh, should find it uh, easier than in an environment of high interest rates, of course. And there's a second point that uh, uh, connects to Minister Arkebe's uh, presentation, namely uh, related to climate warming. We are, in Europe at least, looking for clean energy. And uh, I see a lot of discussions in the German government, for example, that looks but in particular to Morocco and sees uh, Morocco as a source of, uh, of uh, uh, solar energy that could then be exported uh, to uh, to the continent, either electricity or synthetic fuels, power to liquid and all these things. So the combination of low interest rates and this enormous hunger uh, of a decarbonizing Europe for clean energy, isn't that an enormous business opportunity? You're a businessman, Monsieur uh, Mazouar. Bien, alors, uh, <coughs> oui, une opportunité, c'est certain. Avant d'être un homme d'affaires, je suis aussi un homme uh, politique qui est passé par le public, etc. Permettez-moi de faire une petite rétrospective parce mm -hmm. qu'on est à Marrakech. Et à Marrakech, il y a trois ans, s'est tenue la 22e session de la COP. Durant cette phase, le monde était plus concentré sur l'accord historique de Paris et toute la dynamique et l'optimisme qu'il avait entraîné était plus préoccupé par les questions de sécurité, terrorisme. Mais durant la COP euh, ont eu lieu les élections américaines. Et M. Trump est arrivé et la première annonce a été celle de dire « je me retire de l'accord de Paris ». Un fait annonciateur euh, de d'une désolidarisation, d'un consensus dans lequel le monde avançait avec beaucoup d'espoir. 
Et en trois ans, c'est impressionnant ce que l'effet Trump, ou l'effet du leader qui dirige la première puissance au monde, peut avoir sur le désordre mondial, tel qu'on l'appelle aujourd'hui, ou les équilibres ou déséquilibres du monde tel que nous sommes en train de les observer aujourd'hui. Puisqu'on parle de la Chine, je dirais, je suis personnellement heureux qu'il y ait une force qui contrebalance tout cela et qui aide à remettre un peu d'ordre. Nous sommes dans une guerre de position parce qu'il s'agit de deux puissances qui se testent aujourd'hui qui se testent aujourd'hui et qui vont devoir se mettre d'accord demain. Le retour à l'équilibre mondial passera nécessairement par la capacité de ces deux géants qui vont, et il faut que les États-Unis s'habituent à cela, et que le monde occidental accepte le fait, aujourd'hui, qu'il y a une autre puissance qui représente un autre monde qui, avec laquelle il va falloir nécessairement composer, et quand je dis composer, c'est de nouvelles règles qui vont régir le monde de demain. Tout le monde parle de décalage entre le monde tel qu'on l'avait conçu après la Seconde Guerre mondiale et tel qu'il est en train de fonctionner aujourd'hui. On a cherché à faire avancer le G20 comme solution, mais j'aime bien la... la, la, la ce que dit Jacques Attali, il appelle ça le G20, v -A -I -N. Et ceci montre que nous sommes dans une période où il y a beaucoup de questions qui se posent. Et puis on vient sur les taux d'intérêt, comment relancer l'économie, les perspectives de récession, les risques de récession, tout cela est l'effet de ce Big Bang qui est en train de se produire dans le monde, et, dans lequel, nous devons, et que dans lequel nous devons intégrer effectivement tous les risques et toutes les conséquences. Juste pour dire à nos amis occidentaux, quelle est la perception de la Chine par les Africains Pour les Africains, la Chine, c'est deux choses. La première, c'est qu'elle a permis aux dirigeants africains de regagner une part de souveraineté dans les décisions de politique d'investissement et de développement. La deuxième chose, pour les populations et pour les dirigeants, c'est synonyme d'impact, d'effet à résultats rapides et immédiats, même si aujourd'hui, dans les débats, nous revenons sur le fait que les, la Chine vient avec ses grandes bottes, euh, il vient faire euh, des investissements avec des ouvriers chinois et que les ouvriers africains et le, les africains n'en profitent pas. Ça, c'est un autre débat et c'est un autre sujet sur lequel, naturellement, il va falloir euh, revenir. Qui aurait dit que la plus grande puissance économique euh, européenne connaîtrait la situation qu'elle est en train de connaître aujourd'hui du fait de la récession Qui aurait dit que l'Europe allait vivre l'implosion qu'elle est en train de vivre si elle ne fait pas attention aux risques qui sont lui dans le mode de fonctionnement des pays appartenant à l'Union africaine qui aurait dit que le Brexit allait produire, venir et allait produire tous ces déséquilibres que l'Union européenne et l'Europe est en train de vivre. Alors pour nous, maghrébins africains, L'Europe, c'est notre premier partenaire. L'Afrique est proche naturellement de l'Europe, en tout cas l'Afrique subsaharienne, avec toutes les difficultés qu'il y a et les impacts qu'il y a. Nous observons un partenaire qui manque aujourd'hui totalement de cohérence et qui manque de vision de ses partenariats stratégiques, de ce qu'il veut faire et de ce qu'il veut construire. Alors, euh, disons les choses pour qu'on puisse véritablement avancer dans leur solution. J'ai beaucoup apprécié la manière avec laquelle vous avez posé le débat ce matin à l'ouverture. Et vous avez raison de vous poser la question sur 
ce que deviendra l'Europe Quelle est la responsabilité de l'Europe aujourd'hui et de l'Union européenne face à ce Big Bang qui est en train de se faire Mon sentiment, c'est que l'Europe se positionne aujourd'hui comme une puissance moyenne qui accepte de voir deux géants se battre et qui va suivre le mouvement naturellement dans le camp qui l'intéresse. Ceci a un impact sur nous. Ceci a un impact sur nous qui sommes proches parce que nous sommes méditerranéens, nous sommes à côté. Regardez ce qui se passe aujourd'hui au Maghreb. Qui aurait pensé que cette grande boîte noire, avec le traumatisme qu'elle a vécu, qui est l'Algérie, puisse connaître un mouvement aussi profond et aussi pacifique que celui qu'elle est en train de vivre aujourd'hui. Qui aurait pensé que huit ans après la révolution du jasmin en Tunisie, et à l'occasion de ces élections aujourd'hui, qu'il y ait deux candidats anti-système, déjà, après huit ans, deux candidats, deux forces anti-système qui se retrouvent pour le deuxième tour qui va être tranché dimanche. Qui aurait pensé que ce résultat qui a été obtenu lors des élections législatives en Tunisie allait être de cette manière-là Il y a un constat, il y a des forces qui sont bien présentes, et bien implanté, ceci est valable pour la Tunisie, ça sera valable demain pour l'Algérie, parce que la seule force organisée, mais qui ne s'exprime pas encore, est les forces ou les mouvements à mouvance islamique, mais qui rentre dans la rationalité progressive par rapport aux contraintes qu'ils doivent, qu doivent assumer dans la gestion de l'ouverture et également la gestion de la réponse à la demande sociale. Ceci est valable également chez nous. Les forces organisées dans le Maghreb sont les forces qui continueront à diriger et à orienter les politiques à l'intérieur de cet espace. Je ne parle pas de la Libye, tout le monde connaît la situation, mais je suis heureux pour une chose, parce que J'étais un acteur dans l'accord de Srirat. J'étais ministre des Affaires étrangères. Et donc, le Maroc avait abrité ce rapprochement qui était combien difficile et douloureux. J'ai vu des gens pleurer. Des gens de la même famille qui se trouvaient chacun dans un camp et qui pleuraient à cause et grâce à ces retrouvailles. Et on avait beaucoup d'espoir. Mais les forces continuaient à fonctionner pour que la Libye ne retrouve pas la stabilité, parce que chacun voit la stabilité à sa manière. Mais je suis heureux aujourd'hui que la tendance militaire ne soit pas la tendance qui prend le pas dans la solution ou la résolution du problème de la Libye. Je suis heureux également des évolutions qu'il y a en Mauritanie. Tout cela pour dire, tout cela pour dire que le Maghreb est en train de vivre des mutations structurelles porteuses d'espoir. Ce que j'observe en Algérie est porteur d'espoir. Contrairement à ce que beaucoup pensent, l'Algérie ne reviendra pas en arrière. Et donc le pouvoir militaire devra, devra accepter de partager le pouvoir. La solution à la problématique algérienne aujourd'hui, c'est d'amener le pouvoir algérien à accepter la solution du partage du pouvoir. Mais il va devoir composer avec ceux avec lesquels il a mené une guerre intérieure, interne pendant dix ans. Parce que c'est l'une des rares forces organisées qui reste encore en Algérie. Toutes les formations politiques historiques sont rejetées structurellement, radicalement, par les populations qui sont dans la rue. D'où la difficulté de la solution politique qui doit être trouvée. Ceci m'amène à dire que le débat que nous avons aujourd'hui sur les taux d'intérêt, les machins, etc., peut-être dans un an ou deux ans, on va parler d'autre chose. Mais ça fait partie des phénomènes, mais c'est bien d'analyser. Ça fait partie des phénomènes, avec Dominique qui est là, 
que je salue et avec laquelle vous avez fortement collaboré. Je me rappelle de 2009, avec la crise financière, et j'étais à l'époque ministre des Finances, réunion à, en Tanzanie, si vous vous rappelez bien, pour parler de comment aider l'Afrique à ne pas payer les frais. Et je tiens à vous saluer et saluer votre courage pour les facilités et le soutien que vous avez apporté à ce continent, parce qu'on s'était tous mis d'accord sur un fait. On peut réduire les dépenses de fonctionnement, mais on ne peut pas réduire les dépenses d'investissement, parce que c'est ça qui va aider l'Afrique de demain. Et donc tout cela pour dire que je suis très optimiste pour le Maghreb, que la question de l'intégration maghrébine est quelque chose que je commence à entrevoir. C'est le seul allez, espace de résistance à l'intégration. Mais cette résistance est en train de se craqueler progressivement. Et euh, le Maghreb a aujourd'hui une responsabilité fondamentale. Vous devez l'aider, vous, Européens et monde occidental. Vous devez aider dans ce processus parce que un Maghreb reconstitué, c'est une force qui va prévenir et aider à la résolution des problèmes dans le Sahel. Parce qu'elles viennent, elles viennent avec acuité et force. Il ne faut pas se faire d'illusions. La force de la croissance démographique et des problèmes africains retomberont sur l'Europe. Alors, vous avez le choix entre aller vers des politiques beaucoup plus volontaristes, agressives, avec nous, et nous savons faire. Faites confiance à l'Afrique. Elle est capable. Et nous reviendrons sur l'Afrique tout à l'heure, mais juste pour dire, je suis très optimiste sur la construction maghrébine. Je commence à entrevoir les solutions au Maroc. Nous travaillerons pour ça et nous militerons pour ça. Maintenant, sur votre question pour terminer, bienvenue à tous les investissements. Le Maroc est outillé pour le développement de l'investissement dans les énergies renouvelables. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. I think what you did was fantastic here because what you showed us is that the uh, economic prosperity of the Maghreb region is uh, first and foremost an issue of political stability and uh, putting that to the forefront uh, is, is crucial. And I think uh, this gives us a, a good link to talk about Russia. Um, we have uh, the Deputy Minister of Finance uh, with us here. And uh, um, Sergei, the, the question is, uh, while we're talking about Africa as, and, and, and talking about the, the, the interior question of security and uh, uh, stability, when we look at Russia today, uh, we are aware Russia is part of Europe geographically, but it is uh, not part of the political Europe, and that uh, has given uh, rise to uh, economic tensions as well. So continuing on, on, on this motive, uh, politics and economics, uh, where do you see Russia standing today here? What does it mean uh, for the growth perspectives in Russia and for the uh, Eurasian Economic Union that uh, has now emerged over, over uh, the last couple of years? Sergey, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I share the opinion uh, which was said at the beginning of our session, that in principle, the global economy is in a good shape, but it's only in principle. The challenges are accumulating, and this is maybe uh, the effect which still need to be uh, clearly processed and uh, analyze the biggest challenges from my point of view as uh, Deputy Minister of Finance is that during the last probably six years, we're stating in our final declarations on different levels of G20, either ministers or leaders, that the debt is growing. And it is uh, being said year after year, or each half of the year, and still no sign that we will have quite a controlled position. And uh, of course, uh, uh, interest rates environment are stimulating uh, huge borrowing. But at the same time, we see another big challenge in, in this field. As far as uh, almost 17 trillions of uh, 
bonds are being sold below principal uh, uh, with uh, negative interest rates, uh, we see big challenges which are facing uh, uh, insurance companies and pension funds. So I wonder what's going to happen in, in a number of years when th these two institutions, very important ones, are need to services their liabilities with our, uh, before pensioners or those who made uh, uh, signed contracts to ensure their activities. In Russia, even in this environment, we have, we enjoy the privilege to use both fiscal policy and monetary policy as we still have this space to use this. We have low debt. We uh, still far beyond the general level of interest rates, so the central bank can use uh, 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 the monetary policy to, to slowly go to uh, lower uh, reference rates and uh, to keep the markets in uh, better ready for, uh, uh, for the nearest uh, future. But what was most important in my country during the last four years, that we prefer to rely as the uh, benchmarks for our internal policy, not the speed of growth or rate of uh, uh, economic growth, but rely mostly on uh, sustainability of growth and inclusiveness. This is the basis which uh, often been referred to the, uh, within G20 documents. But I, for me, rather difficult to say whether any other G20 uh, economy is really relying on, the, on these uh, benchmarks as their internal policy. In our, in our situation, this has happened. We now uh, passed through the period of low growth rate, but instead we have a strong fiscal position and strong monetary positions. We have finally managed to uh, shape banking system and uh, to get rid of poor institutions and uh, uh, stabilize, stabilize situation in banking sector, which allows to, uh, for credit expansions uh, within the private sector. This is more important. But uh, still, the uh, most uh, important tool for internal policy is fiscal policy or fiscal stimulation. We have uh, now uh, start implementing uh, 12 so-called national projects, uh, which is covering the whole spectrum of internal life. Medicine, education, uh, infrastructure, uh, export promotion, and things like this. Big money are going to be invested uh, from the budget resources and from borrow sources. But uh, on the basis of these national projects, we're expecting that in four years' time, the average growth of uh, Russia would be beyond the average growth of glo the global economy. So it means that we are still face, uh, uh, looking at the uh, global gr uh, economic growth as benchmark, but not the real uh, policy aims. So it's very important in, in terms of uh, decision-making process. Just a couple of words about uh, China. Uh, there's lots of factors that ch China has uh, become a, a new superpower. From, uh, from Russia's point of view, we enjoy the fact, frankly speaking, we rely on the fact, and it helps a lot in terms of overcoming some difficulties in, to, in terms of uh, some different economic and financial restrictions. Now we can rely on a, a deep internal bond market in China, for example. Uh, Russia's company already there. Uh, the government is still thinking about the uh, possibility to use uh, inland uh, Chinese bond market as source of uh, uh, funding. Uh, but what is more important, we, we enjoy the privilege to have strong demand for Russia's 
exports in, uh, in, in China's economy. So I remember when uh, uh, our trade to know between Russia and China was uh, around uh, 10, 10 billion. Now it's 100 billion. It's happened in uh, uh, less than uh, 10 years. And uh, uh, our aim and uh, our Chinese colleagues' aim is that we will have 200 billion uh, of turn uh, trade turnover in uh, uh, 2024. So it means that China will definitely become the second trade partner after European Union for Russia. And uh, just to conclude, maybe with what you've just said at the beginning, what we, where, whether we really face the uh, challenges of losing multilateral approach uh, to the glo in, in the global governance. I think last year was a very critical one. Uh, I, I remember how it was difficult to negotiate uh, G20 leaders' final declarations in Buenos Aires <coughs> when we have one superpower uh, blocking uh, all kind of reference to multilateral cooperation and things like this. Nowadays, especially due to the uh, effective management of the situation by uh, Japanese colleagues uh, as uh, the leaders of or presidency of G20, situation, situation slightly changed. Maybe we can, can be even more optimistic in terms of uh, uh, the fact that multilateralism is not being lost. <coughs> it's still with us, and uh, this is very important uh, because uh, when you, you have the uh, global economy depends on uh, global value added <laughs> chains and this uh, strong tendency that uh, no one single, almost not one single uh, uh, good is being produced in one single country. It's very important to keep these uh, multilateral cooperations in order and uh, multilateral rules in trade uh, in particular in order I as well. So with this I conclude, maybe later on we'll come back to the U Eurasian U uh, Union as you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sergei. Let's now, let's now move to Korea. Uh, we've uh, centered on the transatlantic economy, Africa, Russia, now uh, Korea. The uh, colleagues before have stated that, there is the rise of, that the rise of China for them constitutes uh, a gift in some sense. Uh, uh, I think Monsieur Mouzoir even said this has given back Morocco economic sovereignty. Now, uh, from a Korean uh, perspective, so you have, uh, you're so close uh, to this uh, giant, uh, uh, Chinese economy. What, are, what is your take on it? Uh, is, uh, is this, uh, uh, are you regaining economic sovereignty? Uh, are you benefiting uh, from this, uh, as the others have said? Or do you think the, the uh, geopolitical tensions that uh, come with the rise of China, Korea sitting in between the United States and, and this, uh, this uh, big red dragon, uh, is, is uh, more of a threat than of an opportunity? I'd like to, to hear your opinion on this. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by providing you a, a very uh, brief and a quick uh, overview of Korea's macroeconomic pictures, uh, especially in the global the, uh, context. Uh, certainly, Korea is no exception to uh, the synchronized global economic slowdown. Uh, with Korea's uh, export uh, slowing and the uh, decreasing investment, uh, the business investment, uh, Korea's economy is uh, substantially growing at a less than uh, robust uh, rate, which is only around 2%. As uh, Oliver uh, Blanchard alluded, uh, both exports and investments are directly and indirectly uh, affected by the global economic slowdown and the uncertainty and unpredictability caused by U.S.-China trade uh, conflicts. Uh, even Bank of Korea now forecasts this year's uh, growth 
at only around 2.2%. Uh, I'm very sure the IMF's uh, October outlook will lower the, its earlier Korea's uh, gross prof the, uh, projection. As you must know very well, Korea is uh, a very highly uh, global trade dependent uh, country. Uh, Korea's uh, trade, both exports and imports together to GDP uh, rate is over 80%, one of the highest in the world. I suppose uh, only with the Germany, uh, not many countries, uh, the trade dependency is this high. Uh, and also, uh, nearly 40% of Korea's exports uh, uh, primarily consisting of intermediate goods go to G2 economies, 26.8% <clears throat> to China and 12% to the US. Uh, uh, therefore, Korea is very much concerned about global economic slowdown and the uh, US-China uh, a trade conflict. Uh, as you know very well, Korea benefited so much from the existing post-war, post-war, the liberal economic order. Uh, but now uh, we are very much concerned about the demise of that very liberal multilateralism based world order, especially since, ironically, the US is leading the breakup of the order uh, with it, Mr. Trump's uh, unilateral American first uh, slogan. G2 that is US-China, uh, make up 40% of global economy. Certainly, the trade dispute between these two countries are uh, most critical factor for the global economic performance and the breakup of the existing liberal the, uh, global order. The problem is, uh, I'm sure many of you would agree with me, in saying that the, ten, the disputes between these two countries will prolong. And what that means is the prolonged uncertainty and unpredictability for the global world. We all, I'm sure you saw the news this morning or last night in Washington DC yesterday, China and the US had an, an agreement on their negotiation on the disputes. But as expected, it was a small deal. It's a not big deal. Uh, and I, for one, did not expect uh, any kind of big deal as possible as Mr. Trump would like to have. Um, the reasons I have why these tensions and conflicts between these two countries will be prolonged. I have three reasons to give you. First, the trade dispute, the current trade dispute goes well beyond two nations' trade relationship. It involves two great powers, what you might call hegemonic competition, which is just intensifying. Second, China will not 
easily give up its ultimate goal of achieving what is described as China dream by 2050, and therefore, they will not easily give up on their program of Made in China 2025. So, China being very strategic and the uh, pragmatic uh, nation and people, I'm sure there will be many small deals, concessions here and there, but I think the uh, conflict will be continued because U.S. primacy in both hard and soft powers will continue at least a few decades to come. And therefore, U.S. will also will try to exert its uh, power and project its power. That means that the tension will be continued. Uh, so for the, the uh, uh, for these reasons, I, I would see that there will be a prolonged global uncertainty and unpredictability, uh, and therefore, there will be short supply of public goods, short supply of global public goods, and that is free trade environment and stable finance and uh, currency uh, regime. Uh, okay. I, so maybe I will stop here because we will have a second round. Thank okay. you. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, looking at, at the watch, uh, we are already running short of time, uh, but I and we have many uh, issues on the table here. Unfortunately, fortunately, this conference takes three days, so much of the many of the <laughs> balls that are brought in the game. Uh, it can be played later on. I would like to, to come may, uh, to our... If I may just one second uh, yes. highlight is it's clear that uh, China is a key player and by 2030 China will have the biggest economy and uh, China will be a high income economy. Uh, an issue that is debatable now is whether a bipolar world global order is going to emerge or a multipolar. And I want to bring the dimension of Europe. If Europe could be economically stronger, uh, the <coughs> global order would be multipolar, which is quite conducive for uh, stability. We know that between World War I and World War II, in a period of 25 years, we have had two world wars. Now it's 75 years since we have had a war in this nuclear age, and, and here, Europe came with the right solution of uh, uh, building European Union and, and becoming an important uh, <clears throat> global economic power. And uh, also the U.S.'s involvement during the Marshall uh, Plan <coughs> post-World War II, recovery contributed to this. So one key aspect uh, that, uh, will ha that will shape the future is whether a new bipolar world or multi-polar uh, global order is going to emerge. So thank you so much for reminding us Europeans of our important role. I think uh, many of us here agree. Uh, but maybe uh, Naoki Tanaka has a little bit of uh, uh, salt for us to offer here because uh, you wrote a book about the great stagnation of China. Now we are talking about the bipolar, maybe the tripolar world, but uh, what about the Chinese long-term perspectives. Uh, what is it that uh, gave uh, this uh, title to your book, The Great Stagnation of China? Uh, Mr. Okubei's opinion on Chinese economy is very in interesting, but uh, I disagree with him. Here we go. With him. So uh, mm -hmm. at first, I want to pick up the potential growth rate of China. Uh, when we uh, measure the potential growth rate, labor input, capital input, and innovation side. Three factors exist. As to labor population in China, it's decreasing. It's now decreasing. And as to capital input, uh, I'm not so optimistic. FDI, foreign direct investment from overseas to China, increased very much, but Almost 60% of FDI to China 
came from global Chinese diaspora. So uh, a few years ago, a uh, very important rank of Communist Party uh, said the 60% uh, came from uh, overseas Chinese. However, as you know, in Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, there are a lot of people who are against communist regime. So uh, in the case of Hong Kong, province of Canton will play a very important role. So uh, a lot of money from overseas to China through Hong Kong. So uh, it will be stopped. Uh, such kind of possibility exists. And uh, as to Taiwanese people, the same mentality is now penetrating. So uh, from southern parts of China, uh, there will be some kind of structuring problems, restructuring problems, a lot of employment may be uh, before us. So uh, as to capital input, uh, we are not uh, so optimistic about that. As to innovation side, uh, decoupling of the economy is now being observed. Uh, by uh, Trump administration's uh, challenges for, for uh, China. So uh, according to our forecasting, potential growth rate in China is around 2%. So uh, in the very near future, uh, China uh, will not pass that of the United States. Uh, this will have the influence upon the development course of African countries. Two aspects. One is uh, export of deflation. In China, there are a lot of capabilities as to heavy chemical industries, iron, steel, cement, aluminum, and petrochemical industry, etc. Et almost half of the world capability belong to China. But the uh, demand side in China is now uh, have the problem. So, uh, and a lot of these industries were done by state-owned enterprises in China. SOE is very difficult to restrict them th themselves because uh, communist regime intervened the uh, state-owned enterprises. So restructuring process is very difficult as to the uh, excess capacity of the industries in China. That means the deflationary expect expectation on the global context. So uh, they want to introduce the method for industrialization. But as to the price of their products, uh, it will not increase in, in the meantime. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, second uh, problem exists uh, as to uh, debt ridden type of countries may occur as to the involvement of China. Uh, as to Belt Road initiatives, uh, President Xi Jinping mentioned public-private partnership. Uh, so two years ago, he mentioned uh, in the annual meeting of Belt Road initiatives. So uh, Belt Road initiatives or involvement from China is not that of the Marshall Plan. Marshall Plan was done by the United States in order to rehabilitate the capabilities in Europe uh, by U.S. money. But in the case of Chinese involvement, public-private partnership through PPP, that means involvement from uh, neighboring countries uh, will be necessary. So I'm pick, picking up one example. 
China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, that uh, is the uh, building the tramways from Indian Ocean to, uh, to China through Pamir Heights. What kind of techniques, what kind of infrastructure building will be done in Pamir Heights? This kind of discussion was done even in mainland China. A lot of economists said China, Pakistan economic, as to China Pakistan economic corridor, it's very difficult to build. And the debt problem, debt problem may be left for Pakistan side. So such kind of discussion were being done even in the Chung, Chungang High. In the, so uh, means the, uh, within the capital. So according to my understanding, uh, uh, so uh, it's very difficult to describe the future course of Chinese economy and its influence upon the world, world order. Okay. So thank you very much for this more skeptical view. Raises uh, two questions, I guess. What does this mean for aggregate demand, global aggregate demand, if China is slowing down uh, in that sense? And also raises maybe a question for Japan. Does this not mean that uh, if China is not uh, moving that fast, there's more space for Japan as a regional, as a regional power in, uh, in the Pacific economies? We are running out of time, and I see that people here have questions. So uh, I would like to give the word to the lady here in, in, the, in the white blazer, please. And please tell us whom you are addressing your question to. First, I'll tell you my name. My name is Mona Makram Abed. I'm an Egyptian senator and member of parliament. I'm addressing myself, as you can imagine, to Minister Arkebi. First of all, I want to re-congratulate you for the Nobel Prize that was awarded to your president and a well-deserved one. <laughs> My second point is that I'm very impressed by the advances that Ethiopia has made lately, whether it is in life expectancy and growth, etc. But there is one thing that I want to remind Ethiopia of, is that the Renaissance Dam is a great problem for both Egypt and Ethiopia. There must be more flexibility on your part the president has taken the Nobel Prize because he brought peace between Ethiopia and Eritrea. I hope that the World Policy Forum will inspire him to find some solution, and it must be a political solution because instability in Egypt means instability in the whole region. You know that better than I do. Thank you very much, and you know that the first congratulations came from President Sisi and from the Pope, because the Pope, the Coptic Orthodox Church, plays a very important role in Ethiopia and in Egypt. My second little point, not much, is to congratulate Minister Mezouar for everything he said. Et je voudrais vous, vous adresser la parole en français, comme vous l'avez fait, pour vous dire que moi aussi je pense que La construction, euh, je suis très optimiste pour le Maghreb, mais surtout pour la construction maghrébine qui a été prouvée par ce qui se passe en Algérie et nous allons le voir de nouveau en Tunisie. Alors je vous félicite pour avoir souligné les mutations structurelles qui sont véritablement porteurs d'espoir. Merci. Merci madame. If, if I may reflect on this uh, important point, I greatly appreciate the suggestion mentioned by my sister from Egypt. Uh, I've been emphasizing about a win-win solution. This is a central concept our government is focused. The Grand Renaissance Dam, as you know, focuses on generation of hydropower. It doesn't affect the uh, use of water for other purposes. It only regulates. And from the very beginning, the Ethiopian government sees that Egyptian people should not be affected by uh, such a project. And our leaders are working on it. And I'm optimistic it's going to be uh, resolved. Our destiny 
is mutually uh, cannot be excluded. Please. Well, thank you very much. My name is Mubarak from Senegal. I'm the Director General of the Economic Prospective Bureau. I want to disagree with the disagreement of Mr. Tanaka regarding China. If you take the World Bank figure in 2017, the GDP per head of China was 8,823. By growing 2.5% in 2003, 2030, it will be more than 13,000. So, and the World Bank defined high-income country as 12,056. So I, I think OKB is right. China will become a high-income country in 2030. Secondly, on innovation also, I think it will catch up. Thank you. And at this point, let me maybe bring Olivier Blanchard in, because uh, I have sensed some disagreement as well. And that last word, that's an Yeah, I, I, Listening to the whole conversation, it's clearly essential to know whether China is going to go at 6%. Or 2%, because it determines whether it's going to be a G2 or a G1.5. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and for Africa, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, more optimistic than Mr. Tanaka, although he has spent much more time thinking about China. My sense is indeed on population growth, there is no ambiguity. On capital, it's mostly domestic capital. So even if Hong Kong were to close, there is still a lot. And on innovation, my sense is actually China has achieved a level of uh, technological uh, sophistication which is such that they can have productivity growth from there. So I think the 2% number is, is much too pessimistic. But it's clearly an essential number in terms of the interactions with Africa, the interactions with the US, and how we see the world. So, Noki, if you, if, you, if you please briefly respond. Ch uh, rise of China, it's true. However, when we see the future course of Chinese economy, we are very, we should be very careful. Uh, I am now picking up three animals and three colors. One is a gray rhinoceros. It's a accumulated debt, management of accumulated debt. Uh, when we see the rhinoceros in the zoo, uh, they, they are very stable. But when they get angry, it's very difficult to handle. So uh, that problem, accumulated debt problem is very important for China. Forbearance policies are now being done. Forbearance policy means uh, that's not the orientation of high growth. Uh, that's one problem. Second is the white elephant. So in the case of uh, investment by government sector, very in inefficient equipment, in very inf inef inefficient uh, parts are being now uh, produced. Uh, that would have the uh, bad effect upon the productivity increase in China. Third is a black swan. Uh, in China, uh, there is some kind of possibility of systemic risk. So uh, in the case of um, property management uh, in the rural levels, a lot of foreign money came to China. So refinance program is now being uh, uh, visited. So in the case of refinance of their bond in dollar terms, in some cases, they are, uh, their coupon rate is 12% or 40% or 50%. So uh, in that case, uh, some kind of bankruptcies in development of properties may occur. That may become the allies of Black Swan. That's my understanding. Thank you very much, Naoki. Yes, I know there is uh, much more to be said uh, about all these important points that have been uh, floated here. I think that uh, Thierry de Montbrial has put me in charge here. He's, he thinks that I'm a German. He's actually wrong. I'm from Austria. But nonetheless, my task here is to watch over time we're four minutes late, so for this reason, thank you very much for this panel for an excellent discussion. I hope you'll all be around for the next uh, days so we co can continue this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.